the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. Now, here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. It's been a year of anniversaries. You know, last week we talked about the 70th anniversary of the Bretton Woods Agreement. But this week we mark the 100th year anniversary of the beginning of the war to end all wars. Well, and, you know, with 100 years in the rearview mirror, we can say that with World War II, with Korea, with Vietnam, with various Middle Eastern incursions, you've got Iraq 1 and then Iraq 2, it was really the war to redefine all wars, it not the war to did end not. all wars. Yeah, it did not end it, did no, it? No, in fact, what we've seen is sort of the mass killing with weapons that have, over the course of time, created a distance from the consequences of policy choices and even the choices that a soldier makes played out on a battlefield. We are evolving, but the progress that we're making is really tied to technology and advantaged warfare, which has led to sort of dehumanized choice. We have battlefield statistics. They give us the improved score. And, you know, yes, this is sort of the mechanized warfare which has morphed into almost war games. The real thing is played, but it's played almost Xbox style or, or, or like you're playing a, a Wii 2 game, a tussle amongst friends on the same block, not realizing that there's other people at the end of these joysticks. You know, Dave, it makes me wonder, too, just how vulnerable we are. Just before I came into work this morning, I was looking at my new Air and Space magazine, and, and they're talking about the new Orion space capsule that showed the difference between the cockpit of the old Apollo capsule and the new Orion capsule. And it was amazing. You, you look at these chairs as they're sitting back, and instead of having the normal gauges and dials and buttons that you, you know they pushed during the Apollo era, that were very mechanical, by the way, instead they had just three screens, three computer screens for everything. And I was thinking, gosh, what would Apollo 13 look like when they were having to put things together with duct tape and, and everything else? <laughs> what would Apollo 13 look like with this new technology? And, you know, that's how wars fought right now, too. It's all just screens. And like you had said, you know, these are guys sometimes that are sitting somewhere in California playing a video game, flying a drone over Yemen or, or Ukraine or, or you name it. Well, yeah, and I think the interesting thing is is that that technological advantage can go away under the right circumstances, or I should say under the wrong circumstances. So what makes us the leader of the military world, it could be compromised very quickly in terms of that dependence on technology. You know, you think about what happens when you take your car to the shop, and it used to be that you could tinker. And, you know, maybe it was flush out the carburetor, maybe it was change the spark plugs, maybe it was, you know, this or that to sort of fine-tune your vehicle. Now fine-tuning your vehicle is, you know, taking it to a specialist who hooks it up to a diagnostic computer. They run a, f a fair number of algorithms through the machine to figure out what's wrong or what's right, what needs to be fine-tuned. And then and only then can they get to work because nothing's that obvious anymore. Everything is very technology dependent. Well, and I think we should talk later in the program uh, just about what our vulnerability is because we do feel the war drums of war starting up. You know, in Ukraine, we see it in the Middle East. But what I want to do, let's, let's cover the financial right now uh, while we're talking because false senses of security are being threatened right now in something that has always just been a bedrock. You never break the buck. We're talking about money market funds. Sure. Last week, we talked about money market funds facing the music. We talked about 35% of all money market funds being treated differently. After what occurred, it was scheduled for last Wednesday. The SEC hearings were heard, and they did come up with two things. You know, and I would love to sit down with bank regulators and know their view. Does this benefit them in any way? Does this shift assets out of money market funds into bank deposits or instead, is this really the SEC battening down the hatches in order to preserve the industry organizers, frankly, at the expense of the public? John Q. Public, who's putting money into a mutual fund, and now at the end of last Wednesday, these are the conclusions they came to. Number one, under stress and strain in the marketplace, you'll be faced with an exit fee from your money market mutual funds. So you'll be charged to take your own money out of a money market fund. And number two, an alternative would be that there is as much as a 10-day delay on any redemption from a money market mutual fund. Well, and think about a time of stress, Dave. I mean, how much can happen in 10 days? Look at the Weimar Republic. How much did the mark devalue in a 10-day period? I mean, it could go from 100% down to about 2% in that time period. 
We remember the safety checks that were being done at Chernobyl. Literally, in order to improve the system, they were coming in and tinkering with things at Chernobyl. And it was the safety checks, which in a complex system, ended up triggering a major catastrophe, mm. uh, the meltdown of the nuclear reactor. And, and I think, you know, there's, they're well-intentioned, and the SEC is trying to coordinate things. But in a very complex financial system, it doesn't take that much tinkering in fact, to create major issues down the line. Yeah, so, so the person who would use a money market instead of the bank, which many of our clients do, we've recommended that in the past, they may now turn more toward the banking system yeah, it, because that's it may guaranteed. Well. well, and frankly, I think it may be a push on the part of the Treasury to re-enfranchise Treasury ownership. Mm. You know, money market mutual funds that have Treasuries only right. won't have those same restrictions or limitations or penalties, and so there, there may be growing popularity for Treasury in the money market space with some allowance for extra leverage and extra risk taking just so that those mutual fund companies can make a buck at the same time. Well, Dave, do you think they're preparing for something? Because, I mean, the IMF has come back out and they've said, look, you were going to have slow growth as it was. We said it was going to be 2%. Now we're revising our estimate and saying it's only going to be 1.7%. Now, now that can't be weather, can it? No, well, exactly. We only wish it was snow flurries as the possible explanation for why growth is slowing for the full year outlook. No, the IMF downgraded us to 1.7% in July. They had already downgraded us in June to 2%. And, you know, I guess the one thing you could say is if you're lowering expectations, it may set us up for a whopper of a surprise. You see that oftentimes with Wall Street, they'll lower the forward guidance and then beat that forward guidance by a penny. And everybody says, look at how well they've done, you know, lower forward guidance by a dime, then beat by a penny and you're the winner. To some degree, if you lower it to 1.7 and come in at 1.8, you're the hero. It reminds me of the kid who says, you know, I think I'm going to fail this class, mom and dad. And then he comes back and he's like, hey, I got a C. (laughs) That's exactly right. Oh, you didn't fail? That's fantastic. Well, you know, at the same time, you've got junk bond outflows, which in the last few weeks have been taking prices down and yields are starting to move up. And this this is really a reversal of investment flows, which was fairly predictable. Mm. We're still surprised to see... In the general marketplace, a lack of risk aversion, and we saw this acutely this last week. This is just shocking to me. Yields on junk-rated corporate debt. Right. In Mexico. <laughs> in Mexico. So it's, it's junk-rated, first category of concern. In Mexico, second category of concern. You, now you have not only your regular credit risk, you also have your interest rate risk, and now layered on top of that, you have currency risk. Well, let me guess. I mean, that's got to be paying 15 or 20%. Junk paper should pay 15% in Mexico, and U.S. junk paper should pay 10 to 12 Now, the fact that Mexican junk bonds are paying less than 5.5%, right around 5.23%, mm-hmm. Tells you just how skewed these markets are. And then you've got Spanish 10 year treasuries. They dipped below 2.5% for the first time in two centuries. In two centuries. As we sort of grow numb to what's happening in the marketplace around us, as we get used to a new normal, keep in mind that these are things that haven't happened either in decades or in this case in the Spanish treasury market in two centuries. And I just, I think to myself, okay, this is absolute insanity. In the first half of the year, you've got emerging markets and frontier markets. These are your sort of micro caps, if you will, very small countries. They've issued a record amount of debt. It's up 54% from 2013, according to the Financial Times. And that does not include China, by the way. All of this is on the belief that central bankers are the new gods amongst men. Right, they'll bail anything out. Exactly. Yeah. The miraculous is Even not Bloomberg. only predictable, it's expected. Even Bloomberg's talking about it. Bloomberg is not necessarily the thing you think of when you're thinking about crying wolf. Okay, Bloomberg is coming out and saying, you know, people may be looking a little too much towards these central banks to bail everything out. It's the certainty that we talked about over the last several weeks. And then, you know, what's funny is you'll have some other news pundit come on and say, yes, but the fact that we're asking the question about a potential problem here really underscores the fact that we have no problem at all, because the problems that are the real problems are the problems that we don't see coming. And the fact that you saw it means that this isn't a problem at all. (laughs) So, I mean, it's this back and forth of justification for high valuations. And, you know, in my life, And in my world of investing, I've found the greatest satisfaction, what really in life, coming from lowering expectations, 
the marketplace, on the other hand, doesn't seem to mind the gyrations of setting expectations in extraordinarily high and then seeing, frankly, market prices collapse when disappointment occurs and what you had hoped doesn't come to fruition. Well, we can still measure real business, though, Dave. I mean, when you're making something, going out and actually tilling a field or dragging something into a construction zone. I mean, Caterpillar. Caterpillar, they just keep losing money. I yeah. prefer to count value in terms of Facebook likes because, frankly, I feel more <laughs> valuable at the end of my 500th Facebook like than I do looking at Caterpillar's numbers. No, I, seriously, Caterpillar reports 19 consecutive months of declining year-on-year sales. This is ridiculous. What so, do you think is causing that, though? Because one of their main customers, I think, has been an Asian customer. As, as China has been rebuilding their infrastructure or building for the first time their infrastructure, they've been buying a lot of equipment. They've been buying equipment, but it's also the countries that are in the process of getting materials to China that need you know, heavy earth-moving equipment and whatnot. So, yes, there is a shift in the model of growth from investment there in China and infrastructure growth to the new model of consumption growth. And that metric has begun to grow. Not significantly, but it went from 35 to 36 percent of the economy. And, and again, that's consumption. But it's not moving to a huge degree. You have to roll the clock back, say, 10, 15 years ago, and they actually were at 45 percent of the economy was consumption, and then it slipped to the low 30s. Well, so, can I ask a question, though? Because isn't this something from a Chinese perspective? We've talked to, uh, you know, Pettis. We've talked to some of these guys who are experts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and these guys said for China to actually grow, they're going to have to move away from that investment side of things and grow towards more of a consumption type of economy like America did. Well, sure, and you'll see that impact certain natural resources negatively and certain natural resources very positively. When you look at Brazil, when you look at Chile, when you look at Australia, you've got products that are used for building materials, commodities needed for the development of infra infrastructure, and those products aren't going to be in demand as much. Meanwhile, you've got consumables, which will continue to increase. I mean, the folks in New Zealand are saying, you know, this is like white gold. They've got, you know, herds on every field, and the fact that milk is flowing and being exported to China. China, you know, there's where ag commodities are diverging from industrial commodities. At the same time, there is this minor shift from sort of the investment and infrastructure development towards consumption in China. Well, and, you know, as we look here in America, we were talking about Caterpillar, but one of the great ways of seeing whether we're actually recovering is new home sales. And, and something's fishy right now in the numbers on new home sales. Sure. Well, we've looked at existing home sales before. Last week, we had June's new home sales, which tumbled 8.1%. And the really interesting details in the report were that they revised the May numbers down. They also revised April down. They also revised March down. And I struggle with that because it turns out that new home sales statistics don't actually count new homes sold. I mean, when, you, when you're revising back on a new home sales figure, May, April, March, and 86,000 homes that were sold are now unsold, what does that mean exactly? Are these transactions that weren't completed? They were pending and counted and never went through? Or in fact, are we talking about sort of a statistical model, an aberration where, yeah, well, we, we thought we were going to sell 86,000 on the basis of a particular run rate or this particular methodology. But I think to myself, Pravda would choke on our current methodologies. You know, the, the, the old Russian news agency known so well for propaganda. How do we erase 86,000 homes sold? Well, and you're talking about propaganda. You know, I, I had brought up Bloomberg before, and we don't have anything necessarily against Bloomberg, but there is a propagandized message in Bloomberg. Okay, let's look at the Mark Faber interview. You know, it could Mark's be CNBC. <laughs> Steve Leesman, I was on with him on the early morning show, and we actually nearly got into fisticuffs over. Do you remember that interview? I do, I do. Oh. Yeah. You think people should own gold? I mean, it was it was it was like I've never met a moron quite as idiotic as you. Anyway, that's that same sentiment. So it doesn't matter if it's Bloomberg or CNBC. It is this idea that you should not own it. And Mark was adamant. He was adamant. Looking back and, and talking to the viewer this last week and talking to the interviewer that in December and in January in his published newsletter, he had talked about gold being undervalued and, right. and gold shares being undervalued and, and they should be acquired much more attractive than U.S. equities. And lo and behold, year to date, U.S. equities are up 6 7%, but gold shares are up 20 30 50% depending on the quality of the issue, and gold's up 10%. So I, he was right. Yeah. He was right. But 
that's from the beginning of the year. And I, I think what was curious was the host's antagonism and sort of repeated circling back around to Gold's underperformance over the last two and a half years, regardless of the year-to-date outperformance. And her point was that on a longer time frame, it was a terrible investment. And I, I listened to this interview, and I'm, I'm sitting there almost jumping out of my skin. I wanted to jump onto the screen and ask why the last three years were the only years that mattered, setting aside, and I, I realize, just bear with me, set aside that this has been an inconvenient time for anyone who purchased gold in that time frame. The last two and a half, three years have been ugly. Sure. But the bull market began in 2000 and has, in spite of a nasty correction, remained multiples ahead of equities. Well, I think we should do that. Let's look back, okay, to the start of the bull market, March of 2000. Let's just compare stocks to gold. You've got equities, which take the S&P 500, a broad measure. It's actually outperformed the Dow, so we'll be generous and use the S&P. You've returned roughly 70%. So if you were taking $1,000, it's now $1,700. That's a 70 percent return. That's going back to 2000. 14 and a half years puts you at about 4.8 percent per year in nominal terms, in nominal terms. Now, you want to factor in inflation, then you're talking, in just using the CPI, inflation adjusted terms, you're up about 1.5, 1.48, but let's just call it 1.5 percent. Again, be generous. And that's annual, 1.5 percent a year going Annualized, back to the year 2000 correct. if you were in the S&P 500. That's correct. One and a half percent or nominal returns, 4.8 percent to get you that 70 percent over the course of 14 and a half years. Gold over the same time frame, you took your $1,000 investment, it bought you roughly three and a half ounces of gold at the time. And today, your three and a half ounces of gold are worth right around $4,600. Silver, roughly the same. So from 1000 to 4600 versus 1000 to 1700 and, and there is this sort of constant drone of it's ridiculous investment. Nobody wants it. Roughly 32% per year in nominal terms is not interesting according to CNBC and Bloomberg. And, and by the way, that's off of a peak, because if you wanted to factor in sort of the 1900, I'd have to do the math. That's, uh, let's say, 1900 and, and three and a half ounces would be closer to $6,700. Right. And so it, it just confounds me. The well, way- and even if you take the inflation out like you did with the stocks, okay, let's take three, three and a half percent CPI out. You're still at almost your 28 percent, 29 percent return per year no, since well, 2000. Well, no, let's do this. Let's say we take real world inflation and not the CPI inflation. Right. So let's give them CPI and we'll take full bore eight to 10 percent annual rates of inflation. So let's just say that it only returned 15 percent a year as opposed to the 1.5 percent inflation adjusted. CPI inflation for them, real world for us, one one and a half percent for them, fifteen percent plus for us. Again, it confounds me the way that Bloomberg or others can want to overlook the tremendous move in price already witnessed. Well, and this confirms why they're always late to the party. I mean, they're going to miss the last portion of this precious metals bull market, aren't they? I- I think they will. We've been in a transition. Equities, in our view, in a long term structural bear market with a short-term cyclical bull market still in play as we speak. Precious metals, on the other hand, they're in a long-term structural bull market, a growing market, and they're completing or have completed the cyclical bear phase, about two and a half years of declining and sideways moving prices. Let's go back and define that. Okay, they're secular and cyclical. Sometimes it goes past us quicker than we can actually define it. But give an analogy as to what a cyclical or a secular market would do. Well, Charles Dow, Charles Dow said of secular versus cyclical trends that secular trends are like the tide. It goes in and it comes out. And then the cyclical trends are more like a set of waves hitting the beach. So these are obviously relevant, but in terms of the power and force in the market, the natural force of the tides is more significant than the activity of the waves, even the waves taken in aggregate. So his advice complements ours. This is Charles Dow, who started the Dow Jones Industrial Average, Dow Jones Transportation Average, was the original editor of the Wall Street Journal. Capture as much of any long-term secular trend as you can which frankly is better achieved. It's more easily achieved when you take on the mindset of an endowment. Now, endowment, you're thinking long-term, even intergenerational. Yeah, exactly. Where you're looking at time as a friend instead of an enemy. You're not marching up against it. But if you have an investment deadline or you're managing results for a calendar event 
what you may miss is is the full expression of a secular trend as you attempt to sort of conform the markets to your expectations instead of the other way around. Well, David, I think of so many people. They've watched their friends over the last year, two, three, start to make money in the stock market. And they down deep inside, they know it's dangerous. They know that secularly, we may still be in a bear market, but they just can't help themselves. They'll, they'll sell gold or take some of the cash and go into the stock market. Usually, that's right before the market comes right back down because it's one of those short-term waves. Yeah. When, and I think you know of the number of investors I've spoken to that have retirement assets that target a specific date for retirement, sort of a mutual fund that targets 2035. And the allocation of stocks and bonds is going to get you ready for your retirement date launching into the golden years at 2035 or 2025 or 2020 or whatever the date is. And that allocation, those funds, essentially they shift from stocks to bonds to meet the generic criteria of of lowering your risk as you approach the time frame where income will arguably be more important than growth. And listen, there's a part of me that says, okay, I understand the practical side of that. I understand the planning from a planning point of view that that works. But that's the practical side, the practicable side. Does it actually work? It doesn't. Markets will rarely, if ever, do what you want them to do when you want them to do it. Well, and I think this is a critical point because I have seen this so often where a person is told they can be in stocks until they reach their 50s, 60s, 70s, and and then then they they start moving to bonds. The problem is the cycle, the interest rate cycle, the secular cycle may be wrong. And what that reminds me of, you know, when the tide goes out, if you're near an ocean and the tide goes out and you go in and say, you know, let's camp at the beach. Let's go ahead and set the tent up. If it's low tide, you set that tent up You've got a surprise, okay? When high tide comes back in, and that's the same type of thing. If the secular market does not match your retirement market, you're going to get wet. (laughs) That happened to me when I was 14 years old. We were down (laughs) in Galveston. We were down in Galveston, and we had set up the tents. We'd gotten there late at night, set up the tents, and the next morning we were six inches, you know, with with water (laughs) coming in. That's so funny that you should say that. 14 years old, Galveston, the tide coming in because we set up the tents in the wrong place at the wrong time. Okay, so let's look at the two ways of looking looking at the market because you've talked about, you know, endowment, but not all of us can look three or four or five generations down the road. Even when we talked to Smithers, you know, he told you, he says, you know, I'm probably old enough that I'm not going to be able to make many more of these cycles. And so he's having to alter his investment plans. But he said, if you were running an endowment for, let's say it was a college or an organization, you're not going to make decisions based on today's market moves. No, and that doesn't mean that you sort of philosophically say, well, I'll just take the volatility as it comes either. Right. Because, you know, I mean, that is kind of the view held by many stock brokers, which is you buy stocks for the long run, downside volatility, you ignore completely, and just know that stocks will always take care of you. Jeremy Siegel told you that it will give you 7% rates of return per year, and that's what the statistics show. Well, granted, the last 14 and a half years have upset that idea. So, Dave, is there a balance between the two, actually trading some of these waves and also looking at the secular trend? Well, I think before getting into those details, you come up with two dispositions that I think are very fruitful for for long-term success. One is of market agnosticism. That is to say, it doesn't matter what you own, whether it's stocks or bonds or gold or commodities or currencies, but rather you want to own the assets that you have purchased at discounts. I think anyone with some experience, with some gray hairs in the market will tell you, you make money on the basis of buying low. And secondly, the idea that we mentioned earlier, the endowment takes a longer view. That's the longer time frame. And so when they're looking at asset management, they will accept a variety of risks, which to them are not particularly dangerous or detrimental when time frames are pushed out. I'll give you, for instance, real estate and other, call them illiquid assets. They have an inherent risk of non-marketability, yet when time is factored out so that short-term non-marketability it becomes irrelevant, they can say, we want to own them, and we don't have to sort of weigh in that risk into our risk-adjusted returns. You have a friend who has many, many rental units, and he made sure that he was out of debt so that when the market turned down, he didn't have to sell. I mean, he basically was able to maintain his real estate properties through the ups and the downs. Well, that's right. And that's, I mean, it's clearly another strategy, if you will, of, of keeping leverage to a minimum or eliminating it altogether. If you're sensitive to the cycles within interest rates, you know, but as you mentioned, Kevin, I'm not suggesting that we're all endowments or that any of us have the resources of an endowment. What I'm suggesting is that compelling compound rates are achieved when value is a priority and when time is not. 
For the family that thinks intergenerationally, with a time frame of decades or generations, there is a radically altered and advantaged outcome compared to the person in need or with a priority of a short-term return. Let me give you an example. I know a number of families that have owned ranch land, have owned real estate properties, whether it's commercial properties or what have you, and they've owned them for a long, long time. And these are, let's say, acreage that you bought for $100, 200 $300 an acre that today sells at five or six or seven or even 10000 an acre. That's what I'm talking about. The compound rate of return is compelling because of the cost basis, and that was only achievable by being a multi-generational project. That did not happen overnight. And someone looking to sort of flip a property and make 20% on their money is never going to see the thousands of percent return which come from taking an intergenerational or, again, more of an endowment approach. But there is money to be made as a speculator. I mean, you can't deny for the person who's sitting down well, and, sure. and you know day trading, what have yeah. you. So you've got a Jesse Livermore. You've got the stock operator who today would be in the hedge fund industry. And yeah, there's short-term successes that are, unfortunately, they're not really translatable into a model that you can duplicate. You can't duplicate it and say, kids, here's what I want you to do. Because honestly, you're not going to find that many Stanley Druckenmillers, for instance. He ran Duquesne Capital in concert with the Quantum Fund and George Soros. He was one of the chief traders for the Quantum Fund through Duquesne Capital. You don't find many Stanleys in a generation. So that, I doubt very seriously that his kids will replace him, will again sort of take on the mantle of being a stock operator, a stock trader, the way he did so successfully. Well, and Dave, one thing I've observed, I've had several friends retire so that they could day trade. And I've also had several friends unretire when day trading didn't work in the long run. It's like what you're saying. You may have a model that works for a short period of time, and then you have what they call a flash crash, or you have a black swan event, or you have something like that. And so really, when you're talking more of the take time out of the equation and buy value mentality, those types of things don't affect you as much, do they? Well, you think of it like the Kennedy family. Their MO today is maintaining wealth, and they've tried to do that through multiple generations. Maintain as it gets dispersed throughout the next generation. The Kennedy family is something of a dynasty. But you know what? It's very different than the generation that worked on Wall Street during the Depression and made the fortune. Now they're keeping it, and they're doing their best to keep it, and it has its challenges. But they're not making a fortune. They're simply maintaining. There's no duplication possible when the success is based on an individual and a non-duplicatable strategy. And so the process of wealth building intergenerationally is, in fact, very possible when a value orientation and patience is applied. This relates well to the idea of transmitting the skills that you need from one generation to the next in order to succeed in life. I mean, of course, success is not just a moment in time. It's sort of all the moments strung together in a compelling narrative. And we're not saying that success is merely an accumulation or a multiplication of financial resources. Success includes many more intangible values. But the long process, the long process is similar, whether you're talking about the multiplication of financial resources or the development of character. Nothing is achieved in a day that can't be undone in a day. And I think if you're looking at a greater achievement or a greater establishment of, of resources, whether that's you know, interpersonal, intellectual, or what have you, or physical wealth resources, you take a longer time frame and set a clearer vision to achieve it. Well, then let's go back to the, I really liked that analogy, uh, Charles Dow's, of the tide versus the actual short-term waves. Now, let's take this to gold. We try to always talk about gold, you know, a few times a month, and gold is still in a secular growth bull market, even though we've had a correction over the last couple of years, is it not? Yeah, the growth trend, we should review sort of the dominoes that tend to fall in line that are commensurate with a secular growth trend for gold, because there are a number of complementing elements. Gold is an asset that is no other person's liability. It is money good anywhere in the world, which is to say it is a near cash equivalent on any continent and in any country. It's an asset that under normal times, under normal times, that is sort of a healthy market environment, it gets marginalized and forgotten about. You look at the period from 1982 to 2000, that accurately demonstrates gold being marginalized. When there are diminishing concerns and growth in the economy, the control 
that's provided to the owner of gold, it's less important. So the reason for it being marginalized, yeah, you've got positive rates of return that can allay many of the fears, which in turn diminish any real benefit from owning gold. A growth in demand for gold, as we've witnessed since the year 2000, it's driven by individuals, it's driven by institutions, it's driven by banks, including central banks, which are concerned for one reason or another with either market instability, asset price volatility, an increase in inflation. It can be some social or political dislocation, including international conflict, that would decrease the value of other assets and therein increase the merits of a liquid asset like gold. So when we're considering the broader context on gold and silver, we have to look at a lot of different reasons why people would own gold. You know, I I think of the triangle, though, Dave. When we talk about the triangular investment strategy, there is one-third that is always a foundation in gold and silver because you can't necessarily time the tides perfectly, and you you don't know when things are going to happen. But what you're talking about now is the growth in gold and the future reallocation or exit strategy out of excess gold, correct? Well, to some degree, but I think also when you look at the context which has been supportive to the rise in gold and silver, what we see over the last 10 to 15 years, we see multiple stock market bubbles. We see the bursting of those bubbles. We see the inflation and deflation of a housing bubble along with a return of international conflict with, you know, the regional flashpoints being in the Middle East and you know those between west and east being highlighted by growing competition between the US and China now we have growing conflict between Russia and the west for dominance in the sphere of energy and that'll be my case is that really what's happening in Ukraine with Russia is an expression of western interests in energy and Russia's interests in controlling that energy market and those interests being in conflict these are circumstances which have been to a degree predictable If you go roll the clock back seven years ago when we started doing our weekly commentary, we suggested that financial crises, this is before the financial crisis, by the way, but financial crises lead to economic crisis, which in turn create political crisis. And these political crises tend to trigger geopolitical crisis. This same process of devolution or devolution can work in reverse. And and in reverse, what is it? It's the positive evolution in those same social spheres where geopolitical conflicts are resolved. International cooperation improves. Domestic and political concerns come off of the boil, so to say. And economic growth ultimately complements the expansion of finance and investment. I think a perfect example of that, Dave, is what we talked about, you know, with World War II. Okay, World War II, you went from a geopolitical huge conflict, and then we started to see it work backwards, okay? And so from, you know, the late 40s until really the Johnson administration, we saw some of the best economic growth of the century. So what we had actually, Dave, was a healthy evolution where we went from geopolitical crisis and backed up through the political and then to the economic and then the financial. As the problems were solved. As the problems were solved. That's correct. And that was the great bull market of 1949 to 1967, 68, what we typically think of as a business growth cycle. So in the current context, gold has responded to the last 14 years of devolution in the marketplace of ideas and in the literal marketplace. That trend will continue for months or years to come until resolution to those concerns has adequately muted the desire on the part of institutions and individuals to own an asset that they can control versus other asset choices which are owned through multiple intermediaries where they don't have as much control. You know, and speaking about war and geopolitical crisis, Russia is really highlighting just how fragile the system is. I mean, Time Magazine, Dave, on the cover is now saying that we're in a new Cold War. Well, it does highlight the fragility of the post-Cold War peace. The U.S., is at the same time not helping anything. We're demonstrating sort of a brazen foreign policy. I mean, listen, we ousted the Ukrainian president, our State Department and CIA, and we placed a man who was less supportive of Russia and more supportive of the U.S. in his place. And not 90 days from those changes, we have Joe Biden's son who was brought on as a board member to the largest Ukrainian gas company. That sort of smells, doesn't it? You don't think this looks like an 
amateurist sort of adventurism from the Russian side. I mean, could we state our energy interests in a less obvious way? This is where I, when I think of our foreign policy, it is brazen. Either that or our diplomats are not aware of just how dirty politics is today and how much politicians today are pimping their Rolodexes and gaining a family and wealth advantage through the connections that they have politically. Well, and a regular guest that we have on our commentary here, uh, George Friedman, Dr. George Friedman from Stratford, he told us five years ago that Russia would have to retake that barrier because Russia's only defense, you know, going back to Napoleon, going back to Hitler, the only defense that they've had from invasion has been the Ukraine. It's about a thousand mile or 1100 mile stretch of nothingness that stretches the army out so that they can't really uh, get into Russia with strength. Right. So we isolate Russia. We squeeze its national boundaries. We take away that 1,100-mile flat and very defensible space, the space which gave them great comfort when they fought the French, that space that gave them great comfort when they fought the Germans, and we've just taken that space away by taking out a man who is sympathetic to their interests and putting in a man who is sympathetic to ours. You know, it was interesting. I sat with a friend recently who was somewhat critical of Friedman's conclusions on the Soviet Union. And his view was that, you know, it's just so old Cold War. It sounds like, you know, just sort of the calculus of a Cold War conversation. And I sat there and I scratched my head listening to his criticism of Friedman. I tend to agree with Friedman, by the way. But Putin is a Cold Warrior. That's all he knows. You can't take the Cold War out of a man that was educated and trained in the context of the Cold War as a KGB officer. We are neglecting any subtlety of action in our posturing with Russia. And if we're not careful, we may very well goad the bear out of its den. There may be no Archduke Ferdinand. This is, again, hearkening back to 100 years ago and what started World War I. It could be a different kind of noun that triggers a war. Maybe it's a place or a thing this time instead of a person. Well, and it seems like we're poking the bear, literally, right now. We're poking the bear because, you know, you have this very complicated situation with the shoot down of the Malaysian aircraft. All right. And unfortunately, the Netherlands were affected dramatically. I mean, I think more than half of the plane were from the Netherlands, were they not? Well, it's right over 200 out of the close to 300 on the plane. Yet we have this decision that's coming out of The Hague, out of the Netherlands this week, that's representing the Western world, and it's really more than a slap on the hand to Russia. Right. So The Hague hands down a $50 billion settlement for Russia, pays to shareholders of UCOS, that is the dissolved Russian energy giant taken over by the state, following the UCOS CEO mobilizing energy resources and finances against Putin and his political ambitions. And of course, the challenger was silenced, accused of tax fraud and thrown in jail, and now is, I think, sitting in Switzerland. But all that to say, The Hague settles the claims in arbitration with a fine that is 20 times, 20 times greater than any handed out by that body ever before. Well, let me ask you, I mean, does the Netherlands connection have anything to do with this kind of judgment? Because it's just an amazing shot at Russia. I don't think there is a connection. But you know what? If I were in the Russian shoes, I couldn't help but feel as if it was awfully convenient. So the Hague is in the Netherlands. 200 of the lives lost on the Malaysian flight were from the Netherlands because, as you may recall, Malaysia is a former Dutch colony. So just let this all settle in. The timing may be coincidental, but we have what appears to the Russians to be a united Western assault with the European powers pushing for tougher sanctions, The Hague sending a bill for $50 billion, and the U.S. accusing Russia of direct military involvement in Ukraine. Concerning the Yuko settlement, I mean, this week, one of Putin's advisors, one of the people who's very close to him, said this, we're not concerned about the $50 billion. Why? It's insignificant compared to Ukraine and that geopolitical standoff. This is a quote. There is war coming to Europe, he said. Do you really think this matters? I think we should just stop and pause on that. Okay, so you have one of Putin's top advisors who's saying there is war coming to Europe. Do you really think the $50 billion matters? Unbelievable. Well, what are the opportunities? I mean, (laughs) this is perhaps where I get a little cynical, but are you an arms contractor selling hardware to Poland? (laughs) I mean, are, are you building an LNG, a liquid natural gas terminal in the Gulf Coast so that you can export product to Europe? Are you Joe Biden's spawn picking up where the Russians left off, supplying gas to Germany and Western Europe? I mean, you want to know the height of irony? You want to know the height of irony? Young Biden is there to consult on corporate governance 
ethics and transparency. <laughs> a better in Ukraine, I guess, than here, huh? That's one for the history books. And I, I tell you, it's audacity of this caliber which tends to start wars. It just it completely ignores the consequences of choices. It ignores what is being not just communicated from you to them, but what is received on the other side. How is the message received and interpreted? To be quite honest, I see gold as an asset to own, not because of these tensions, but because these tensions and others like them still to come are symptomatic of that crisis domino effect that we've been talking about for seven years from financial to geopolitical. You want gold until values of other assets are more compelling elsewhere. And that elsewhere today is not anywhere to be found. You've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. You can find us at McIlvaney.com, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com, or just give us a call at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. 